Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emek Alfobara. I'm a partner with Next Year Power. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the August 2017 Next Year Power Dialogue, an initiative of Next Year Power. Today, we'll continue to explore the renewable energy sector by discussing waste power. According to the International Energy Agency, Nigeria has an annual biomass potential of about 144 million tons. Given this statistic, it is important to take advantage of waste power because it will not only provide much needed additional power source, but also combat the chronic issue of waste disposal in the country. It is our aim that at the end of the next two hours, we'll all be more informed of, of this emerging frontier and we, can, and we can use knowledge to further address the current energy challenges. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our moderator for the evening, the General Secretary of the National Think Tank of Nigeria, Mr. Jerome Okolo. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome to tonight's event. Um, it's a very exciting topic in terms of the fact that the topic of tonight is not one of those topics that looks at one small part of the energy challenge. The topic for tonight is the waste to power, looking at the market availability, the cost-benefit analysis, and looking at the future, the potential, and what we've achieved so far, what are the limiting factors, and how we can move forward. Um, the reason I say that this is different is that waste to power essentially looks at the entire chain from how we generate power, why we generate power, what we generate when we generate power in terms of any waste products, what we generate in terms of when we live in society, what kind of waste we generate, and what we can do with that waste. And in, in, in this case, we will also look at the opportunities that waste to power present to us in terms of closing those gaps that have been exposed by the lackluster rate of development of our grid-based energy supply framework in Nigeria. We, we are hoping that by the time we finish this evening, uh, many of you will leave here with a lot of exciting ideas about new things that are happening in Nigeria, new things that are happening in Africa, and new opportunities for business, and new opportunities for closing the development gap in Nigeria. Um, tonight we will have uh, three uh, panelists join us. These three panelists bring a wealth of experience to this topic. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce um, the Regional Sales Director for General Electric Sub-Saharan Africa, Toyin Abegonde. Um, please come up to me. It's a, a more resounding round of applause. Toyin Abegonde is a trained process engineer with vast engineering and business management experience across the Nigeria energy and natural resources industry. She has over 14 years of professional working experience by business strategy consulting, business development, project management, and process re-engineering. Currently, Toyin is the Regional Sales Director with Distributed Power Business for General Electric in the Sub-Saharan African region, where she is responsible for the commercialization and market penetration of the Gen Becker and Wakeshua reciprocating gas engines in the region, working closely with channel partner distributors across this region. Prior to this role, she was the regional channel leader for distributed power for General Electric. Toyin has a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of Lagos and a Master's degree in Process Engineering also from the University of Lagos. Prior to GE, Toyin worked for Accenture, Siemens, and Access Bank. Please, can you please uh, welcome her again to the examining <laughs> Join Toyin on the panel, we have Fatima Ademo. Fatima. <laughs> Fatima is an energy and finance specialist with over six years of experience in project financing, sustainable energy, project development, bioenergy, integrity, and the nexus between energy access and other components of the sustainable development goals. Fatima currently serves as a lecturer at Bayes University and lead, and she is the lead project development, developer for Waste to What, 
a United States Africa Development Foundation funded rural electrification of a renewable energy project being implemented by Ajima Farms in Nigeria. In this capacity, she has led the preparation of funding proposals, supported site identification, assessment of willingness and ability to pay for electricity, procurement, due diligence, and the review of schedule for project implementation. Fatima has served as a business development executive with Novantus Energy, where she conducted research on new business opportunities in electricity, waste management, water, and oil and gas sector. This led her to full grasp of regulatory and environmental compliance frameworks for utility-scale clean energy projects. And she has also participated in the Nigerian Electric Power Sector Reform Act and Gas Market Monetization Strategy. In this capacity, she developed, co-developed proposals for 20 megawatts solar PV power and 15 megawatts waste to energy power in Newe in southeastern Nigeria. She is a 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow and a 2017 Unleashed Innovation Lab talent. Please can you welcome Fatima. <laughs> Finally, but not the least, um, I would like to invite to the panel Andrew Echono. Andrew is a keen, well-motivated finance professional with several years' experience in compliance, taxation, and internal control. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Accounting and an MBA in Management with specialization in agribusiness. Andrew is the Country Program Director, sorry, Country Program Coordinator for the United States Africa Development Foundation, USADF. Andrew has also worked as a Grant and Subcontract Associate with Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, now called the Center for Integrated Health Programs, where he was responsible for U.S. government contracts and grants administration. He has also worked as grants manager for USAID Feed the Future Nigeria Livelihoods Project at Catholic Relief Agency before joining USADF as country program coordinator. At USADF, he is responsible for developing and monitoring projects across three core portfolios, agriculture, off-grid energy, and youth entrepreneurship. Andrew has experience working with a range of international donor agencies including United States Agency for International Development, UK Department for International Development, and Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Global Fund to Fight HIV and AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, as well as working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, um, can you please welcome and again with a round of applause. So we will take um, presentations from the panel, panelists and um, I really crave your indulgence to pay attention and uh, make some notes and we should follow the presentations with the discussion and there will be an interactive session uh, where you will have opportunities to ask for clarifications and perhaps invite uh, some of the panelists to uh, give you more detailed explanations about things they have um, presented. So first of all, we will take the presentation from uh, Tony. Good evening everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I want to start very well with the, actually appreciating the next step power for setting up such uh, a program. I think the more dialogues we have about the power sector, the more we talk about the opportunities, the more we sort of enlighten ourselves about what needs to be done, I think the better we will get um, as a nation. So I think it's very timely that we're having this session talking about waste to power because more than ever before as a country we need to think beyond just to share exactly our views as General Electric and also our wealth of experience in the waste to power space. So once again, um, I'm going to be talking about the topic, the ability of waste to power in Nigeria, um, future outlook from existing projects. Unfortunately, I don't have slides, but I'm going to talk through a couple of points. Um, and I think will be beneficial for the dialogue we're going to be having this evening. Um, it's amazing, I mean, if you look at the data that exists on Nigeria, what's shocking is the volume that is collected. So yes, there's a huge volume of waste that is generated, but only 20 to 30% of that waste is collected. And this, this is data that I got from the World Bank. And it's amazing, and it's not surprising anyway, because if you walk the streets of Lagos, or you walk the streets of, you know, every more cosmopolitan city in Nigeria, 
you see waste everywhere, right? And, and clearly, as we see that waste, opportunity, waste of power is a big opportunity, the, big, the biggest barrier is the fact that we don't have a clear waste management and waste collection policy of waste. I mean, a lot of us know that when we travel out, you know, when you see trash bins, you see, you know, plastic, you see a different bin for plastic, you see a different bin for organic waste, you see a different bin for paper. The reason why that waste is collected that way is to ensure that for all the organic waste that is generated, it goes appropriately to either a waste to power plant or a recycling plant. But in Nigeria today, yes, we generate a lot of waste, but all of that waste gets into the wrong places. It gets into the, the drains, it gets, in, you know, it gets on the roads. And the starting point for us to be able to analyze the feasibility and the viability of waste to power in Nigeria um, is really starting with a clear integrated approach to collecting, a clear integrated approach to managing, and a clear integrated approach to also recycling waste. So that, that would be my, my starting point uh, for us to sort of ponder about. And I think if you look at Lagos State, Lagos State I think is, is the front runner um, here in terms of developing a policy. I know that just recently they set up a waste management policy and they also invited a private sector basically to ensure that there is a proper collection and a proper recycling of the waste. And, and clearly it's going to be in the hands of private sector because they've also realized that the government is not in a position to manage it the right way. It was in the hands of the government before, but now they've invited private sector to, 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 to sort of manage that. So that's going to be the starting point, a clear management, um, waste management policy um, to encourage the sorting, the collections, um, and I mean the management of the waste. And, and clearly the reason why this is important is because if we're going to set up a waste management, a waste to power project, you need to be able to guarantee a specific volume of waste. You need to be able to guarantee the consistency of the waste. You need to be able to guarantee the quality of the waste. That can actually make or mar the project. Exactly the same way you will set up a power plant, a gas power plant. And the first thing you need to think about is where is the gas going to come from if there is any gas, right? If you set up the power plant, and we know this very well in Nigeria, where we have you know, large power plants, 500 megawatts, 400 megawatts, all set up, sitting there, iron sitting there, but there is no gas to fire it, right? So the first thing also for a private developer is to say, where is the waste going to come from? What kind of waste am I looking at? What, how can I guarantee the volume of the waste? How can I guarantee the quality of the waste? And how can I guarantee the consistency of the waste? Because for you to design the project in the first place, you need to have an idea. What kind of waste am I going to get? What is the consistency of this waste? And how, what is the volume? Because that also determines how big you know, the project is going to be. So that would be my number two point, is to say the first point clearly is on a countrywide uh, approach, we need to have a clear waste management pro uh, policy. And then on the project development approach, each of the project developers to, to, to determine whether the project is viable or not, you need to have a clear source, a, a clear source for your feedstock, such that you are guaranteed a certain volume and a certain consistency of the waste. And then the third thing I want to talk about is the cost of the power. The cost of the power. I mean, we know today, I know there's a lot of debate in Nigeria around how much are we willing to pay for power? You know, should NERC or should the government increase the tariffs? You know, there's always that agitation. But the truth is that we're paying so much. I mean, if we do an analysis of how much we're paying on our diesel fire generators today, it's in the, in the range of 80 Naira upwards per kilowatt hour. It's amazing. But what was the tariff, the, the MITO tariff? Um, I mean, what does it say? We, what do we pay? 20 to 30, depending on what uh, you know, customer category you are in. But it's amazing that although the power from the grid is not um, sta is not stable, we are ready to pay as much as 80 naira for diesel. So clearly, it's not a case of whether we can pay the tariff or not. We are paying it either in in, in economic inefficiencies or by direct you know diesel cost. So for you also as a project developer who is looking at ways to power, the other thing you want to look at is how much am I going to be generating this power at? And we've done our analysis, and it's clear that, and we have also project case studies. I'm going to share a case study um, as I round up. 
clearly it is feasible. If you do, if you run a waste to power project in Nigeria with a clear source, sustainable source of, for the waste, it is feasible and the tariff ranges that you're going to probably land at is going to be somewhere between 30, 30 to 50 naira per kilowatt hour depending on the waste and depending on how much distance, over how much distance you need to transport the waste to the site and the logistics around that. And that shows that versus diesel, you actually have savings. You actually have savings versus diesel because I think that's the only other alternative that you can then compare a waste to power project um, with. So clearly it is feasible, but there needs to be a clear integrated approach around where the waste is coming from, you know, is the volume consistent, what policies are there from the government to actually support, you know, the project. Because for some of the, you know, countries that we've worked in, for example, in Kenya, in Germany, for example, there are clear policies by the government and incentives that the government provides to, be, to ensure that the waste and power project actually kick off. Because it's not just the power generated that is going to be the benefit for a waste and power project. There is a huge economic benefit, there is a huge environmental benefit as well. You're generating power, you're providing power to where it's needed, and at the same time you're tackling a huge environmental challenge. The more we sort of put it out to the government that this is a big opportunity, especially in terms of powering remote areas where there is no grid, and where the only alternative is diesel, right? There is a case, but of course with some government maybe um, incentives around taxes, not direct tariff subsidies, no. Tax credit, something around maybe custom duties and all of that to enable the financial viability of the project. I'm going to leave us with just the power project, for example, just to give you a sense of how much waste will be required. Because I think most times we talk about it loosely, that it's a big opportunity, but we also don't get a sense of how much waste is going to be required. And I'm talking about biodegradable waste here. So for example, if you want to set up a one megawatt project um, using anaerobic digestion, we're going to be talking a bit about technologies later. Um, clearly, you're going to need dung from 7,000 cows for one megawatt. That is a lot of cows. And the question I ask myself is, if I want to set up such a project, where exactly in Nigeria do we have such a, a large farm where I can unless dung from 7,000 cows in a, in a sustainable manner? That's number one. And then if I want to also you know, uh, give you a, a sense of how much waste will be required if you're looking at chickens, because I think we can also relate very much to chickens. You're going to need about 3 million chickens the dung and the waste from 3 million chickens for one megawatt. The reason why I'm throwing these numbers out is just to have a reality check. So that when we talk about waste to power, um, of course there are different technologies. And I've heard people talk about, I want to do 100 megawatts of waste to power. The question is, where is the waste going to come from? And what kind of waste? Are you, are you talking about biomass waste? Are you talking about biodegradable waste? Where are you going to annex that from? So I just threw those numbers out there just for you to think about it. Then I will end with a case study of the project we did in Kenya. Um, it's a 2.8 megawatt um, biogas to power project. It's a very interesting project because it's an integrated waste to power project, integrated with the operations of a farm. So the farm is sitting on 800 acres hectares, 800 hectares of land, and basically the location is somewhere near Nairobi, uh, Lake Naivasha uh, in Nairobi, and the, the farm actually, um, on that farm, they, they, they planted vegetables, they planted flowers, and that farm actually exports a lot of the vegetables, it's a big exporter out of Kenya uh, into the entire region, they export vegetables, they export flowers as well. So before they export, they do a lot of cuttings, a lot of preparation. So there is a huge amount of waste that is generated on that farm. And clearly, the owners of the farm saw an opportunity. It's sitting on 800 hectares of land. There's so much waste, biodegradable waste. And clearly, what they did was to develop this integrated plant such that the, the feedstock is guaranteed because the plant is sitting right on the farm. The feedstock for the 2.8 megawatts is guaranteed. The farm does not need 2.8 megawatts of power. 
the, the farm is only consuming, I think, about 500 kilowatts. And so the remaining 2.3 kilo, uh, megawatts is actually sold to the grid. It's sold to the grid. There is a PPA that is signed with the uh, Kenya Power Authority. And so the farm also generates revenue from the power that is generated. It's quite interesting because it's the GE Yembaka engines that are installed there. It's two engines, containerized unit. It can be built out as well. It's modular. So they started with 2.8, but as the farm operations grow, they can add on engines, clearly. And the other thing is that it's a combined heat and power installation. And what that means is the, the heat from the generator is unnest and is also used in the greenhouse um, facility that they have on the farm, basically to enable the, uh, the growth of the, of the vegetables. And then at the same time, the byproduct from the bio anaerobic digester is organic fertilizer, which is then used to sort of enhance the output on the farm. So the efficiency of that operation is 99%. 99% and at the same time the farm is generating additional income. I mean you can't get it better than that and the, the question I really want us to really talk about here today is where can we replicate such in Nigeria? I know we have big farms in Nigeria and I, my, I mean my team actually we've, we've invested a lot of time and a lot of effort in looking at the largest farms in Nigeria talking to quite a number of um, food processors Finding out, you know, how much volume of waste do they generate? Is it consistent? Can we set up a plant? You know, I know that the ca capex outlay could be a barrier, the initial capex outlay, but there are ways we could work around this, right? There are ways we could work around it because we also have, within our business, we have an industrial finance team that then looks at how we can sort of spread out the capital outlay over a period of time, sort of converting that capex into an opex. So you pay back on the equipment over a period of time. So there are ways. Um, we could sort of walk around that, but the, the issue is really how can we set up an integrated waste to power project in Nigeria with the waste volumes and the waste quality, you know, in a consistent manner and integrate that with a rural electrification project. I didn't mention this about the Kenya Kenyan project, the power that the excess power that goes to the grid actually powers about 5,000 to 6,000 houses, homes in the rural community where the farm exists. I mean, that is community development, and that is, I mean, there is no way that community um, will agitate or disturb the, the operations of the farm, right? And those are the, the ways we need to start thinking about ways to power, not just as a standalone, but in, we need to think about as an integrated project where there is a benefit also to the, to the community, of course, at the cost. You know, if Embed, for example, is willing to, to sign a PPA for, for the power, they can win it to the community, but of course you also get your revenues then um, as a project developer. So I think I've left you with some points to think about, um, and I think that's where I will end. I think in the interactive session we can provide more details on Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard um to uh, presentation from the point of view of a large-scale integrated farm-based waste to um, energy project. Um, this is not the only approach, but this is a, an approach that is worthy of attention. Um, this is an approach that I think we should look at in detail because it holds, for example, it holds um, uh, solutions for some of our agro-based industries that have tried to locate themselves far away from the urban centers and have run into energy challenges. And because of lack of lateral thinking, um, sometimes they've used um, the cost of providing diesel to such remote farms as a basis for considering the viability of such farms and have not proceeded with their investment. So this is an, an example of the kind of opportunities I think we should look at today, where um, people in this room, uh, power developers in this room, can integrate with um, agro developers and say to them, if you want um, a 10 back, uh, you know, um, a one megawatt project, for example, uh, for the sake of argument, in a remote farm, and you can guarantee the quality, the quantity, and the consistency of the waste, then we can provide you with a workable project, which you can then integrate at the project development phase to find investors who can actually fund the development of the agriculture side and the power side together. 
Um, I think um, the next um, presenter is going to move us from, um, you know, from the, the scale of, uh, of towing uh, 3 million chicken to um, the kind of scale that we're used to, uh, more uh, compact, more family-based, more village-based uh, scale of uh, generating uh, power from waste. Um, Fatima Ademo is going to talk to us um, about um, the, her approach to um, uh, waste to power um, development and she will also give us concrete examples of projects that have taken off in Nigeria uh, with which uh, many of you can relate. So without much ado, I want to invite uh, Fatima to take the restroom. Please. Thank you, um, thanks to Next Air Power for providing this platform for such dialogue. Um, so as um, he already mentioned, I'm a project developer for a 20 kilowatt system where we use anaerobic digestion. But briefly, I will speak to other technologies so that you don't live here thinking it's just AD digestion in the waste of power sector. So when you talk about technology, we have gasification. You could gasify rice hogs. We have a lot of rice hogs in a boy state in Taraba. Um, these are states producing large volume of rice, and these rice hogs are basically just left out there while they could be producing electricity to actually support that operations. We also have incinerator or combustion, which is basically burning all forms of trash that can go into a gasifier or can be used for um, anaerobic digestion. And then you have the anaerobic digestion, which I'm more familiar with. So it's basically taking your biodegradable waste, like food waste, um, animal produce waste, as she mentioned, putting it into a biogas system, and in the absence of oxygen, it breaks down and generates um, biogas, which can then be used for powering turbines or biogas generators. And this waste is available in Nigeria. I mean, as I mentioned, with the example of rice hogs, when you look at a state producing rice hogs, it's a volume of waste just lying there, and these communities is actually a burden to the communities and to the business, as opposed to it being a resource that could be used for electrification. When you also talk about <coughs> tons in terms of the quantity, we have about 144 million tons of waste in this country that could be used to generate electricity, but currently not being used. When you look specifically to um, animal waste, we don't have a figure, statistics for animal waste, but a published um, document estimated about 290 million um, animals we have in the country. So you can imagine how much waste um, those animals are generating that could be used for electricity generation. So we'll go a bit to talk about target market. Who could use such solutions? So we have the small scale solutions and the large scale solutions. So small scale solutions can fall between 10 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts, and you could have um, large scale solutions from um, 100 kilowatts to 3 megawatts, um, as the case may be. This could also be used for off grid electrification or on grid electrification. So for my projects, an off grid project in a rural community in Kujia that has no access to the national grid. There could also be industries that could use this. So the industries you're looking at, the sawmill industry, um, in this country, especially in the south, we have a big sawmill industry who are cutting down trees, generating sawdust, but again, not using it to power their operations. Um, it could also be poultry or cattle farms. Uh, we have, even though not large to the scale to you mentioned, but we have quite a number of poultry farms. Just on the Kujay axis, you have premium farm with about 300,000 birds. You have Dansariki farm with about 250,000 birds. So we do have these farms that could be using their waste to produce electricity rather than relying on diesel. You also have the abattoirs around the country. In Abuja, we have Kujay, we have Gogleda and the abattoir in Dede producing huge volume of waste that have been lying down there for years, creating a health and an environmental hazard and not being used to generate any electricity. And then you also have communities, so small communities like the ones I'm working in that have small poultry farms and also generate waste that they could also use in powering of themselves. And finally, you have waste management agencies. In an ideal situation, when we have a closed loop, where the waste is actually properly being collected, managed, the waste agencies can actually use this waste to also provide electricity or heat, depending on the form of energy that is required. So what are the revenue sources for such plants? So in developed countries, and also in places like Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, they get tipping fee, and tipping fee makes up to 70% of the revenue for such waste to energy facility. So basically, the tipping fee is you're paying from your household level, you're paying for your waste to be collected, and that money is being paid to the waste to energy power plant for accepting your waste, as opposed to it going to the landfill and just sitting out there, percent of your revenue. And then you have byproducts. 
So from the biodigestion process, a byproduct is biofertilizer, which can be sold to farmers. If you're also using gasification or combustion, you also have other byproducts like ash that could be used in the cement industry. So you actually have multiple sources of revenue. Say the tipping fee is not realistic now because from a home level, we don't pay for our waste and it's not going to be sustainable for the government to pay that tipping fee. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about cost, but since you already mentioned cost, so I will skip the issue of cost. I say the first is the lack of awareness and a valuable technology. Most people you speak to and you tell them you want to convert waste to electricity, it's like, how is that being done? Is that possible? So there's really a knowledge gap where a lot of people are not even aware that the resource, the waste we're seeing can actually be used as a resource um, to power. And there are several technologies available that has matured in, you know, in several countries, but then we need to speak more about these technologies and get people more familiar with the technology so we can have more project developers doing waste to power um, in Nigeria. Second, we also have feedstock volatility. You know, as she mentioned, it's just like doing a gas power plant. The first question is where you're going to get the gas from. So doing a waste to energy power plant is where you're going to get the waste from. So there's a big issue where we don't track, we don't have concrete records. Even the World Bank record of 144 million is estimated based on the population of the country, not on, on the actual waste being sitting, um, sitting down with landfills across the country. And the reason we don't have such records is we don't have you know, a closed loop waste management system because literally, in, depending on where you live, you could just leave your house, walk five uh, minutes away and dump your waste and nobody says anything. Only if you live within the city, but when you live outside the city, we don't have a concrete waste management system. So you need to ensure, we need to think about how are we going to ensure we have you know, a closed loop system when it comes to waste management that you can track where the waste is being um, produced, transport it to proper designation and use it. And without these figures, waste developers would not have you know, the concrete steps on how to develop a waste power plan because you really do not know what waste is available. The other alternative is to do what I did, to go where the waste is and you ensure that the waste is always going to be there, i.e. a farm or an industry generating that waste and put your systems there. And then you also have the issue of capacity development. Most of this, or all of the equipment when, you, when it comes to waste to power are not being developed in the country. They are either equipment from the US, German equipment or um, Chinese equipment. And you find out that a lot of people, because they don't even know about it, are not able to operate or maintain such systems. So there's also a capacity gap. And then the issue of financing, as Tony mentioned, the capex is high when you're doing a waste to power plant. But then, you, there are creative ways you can go about that, and I'll speak briefly on what are the possible revenue sources or possible funding sources if you want to do um, a waste to energy power plant. Then you have policy. For us to have a completely closed loop um, waste management systems, it's going to first be driven by policy before the private sector can kick in. Most of us here don't see waste management as a service. But in countries, even not developed countries, in developing countries like Kenya, Rwanda, you can't just throw away your trash. You have to pay for your waste because it's just like getting electricity in your house or water in your house or internet on your phone. It's a service that someone comes to pick up your waste. And until we get to that level where we see that you know, waste management from the home level, it's a service. That is how that whole value chain will be productive. Because when we start paying for it, then you are sure that someone would actually come to pick up that waste and take it to the proper um, designated site where it's supposed to be. And then you also, we also don't have landfill tax. Again, as a result of not having you know, a whole closed loop system. If you had landfill tax, and before you're able to throw out any trash in the landfill, you actually pay for it, then it makes that whole system more closed loop. So these are some of the things on the policy side that we should start thinking about. How can we lobby to ensure that we have proper waste management systems? And what are the benefits of having a waste management um, plant? I'll speak to just some of the benefits. First is air pollution. Air pollution accounts you know, for a lot of sickness, not just in Nigeria, in the whole of Africa. And this is directly resulted to how we dump our waste. I tell you from experience, from the farms located in Kuje area, last year, January, most of us lost poultry beds on that location. And it was because of the waste management practices. On that axis, you have at least one million birds. And the way they dump their waste is everyone literally putting their trash on the road. It was bound to create a health hazard, not just for the humans, but also for the animal itself. Um, secondly, is the degradation of environment and contamination of groundwater. So when you start heaping biodegradable waste, over time, it, it kicks up into you know, a solid material, 
and then they start leaking out leachate and that contaminates the groundwater which again can affect humans and animals. You also have you know, the waste, when it's biodegradable waste and it's just sitting out there, it's releasing methane into the atmosphere and also increasing um, greenhouse gases emission. And you also have loss of recycling revenue. So imagine creating a waste of power plant, even a small power plant of one megawatt will probably employ maybe about 15 to 20 people. But because we're not using this waste, we're also losing such economic um, advantages we could be getting from it. So potential investors for such a project. So first is Power Africa, it is for off-grid project, and I'm sure Mr. Andrew will speak um, to such. They are the funders of my own project. They sponsor um, small projects in that electrifying rural off-grid communities. Second, you also have Powering Agriculture. Powering Agriculture is a program by USAID, and they also fund um, biodigesters um, project because they know of the effect it could have on also um, producing electricity for the farmer and also providing the manual which um, the farmer could use. You also have vendor financing. So basically, most of the vendors that make equipment and generators are able to offer financing. I know of many in Germany, Austria, Denmark that provide financing for such equipment because they know there's a challenge where most developers are not able to you know, pay for the capex upfront. So they give you some sort of financing. And Ms. Toyin also spoke about the GE financing. So they are financing available for that. You also have social impact fund, like the Acumen fund. They provide financing, but they will not provide first stage financing. But from second round, when you've done your feasibility study, you have proof of concept, they will put in money for such projects. Um, you also have the traditional financing, equity and debt financing that you could also capitalize on. And if your project is in that rural electrification, you could also um, approach REA, because right now they are currently putting up a rural electrification fund, which can also support um, such projects for rural electrification. So that is all for now. I would want to hear more from you during um, the Q&A session, especially as it relates to my project and my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. I think uh, if I agree with Mitch, uh, Fatima actually um, she delivered on the promise I made, which was to bring us down to the human scale and um, to this area can actually begin to have a grasp for what is immediately possible before you then get to the scale of uh, uh, toying where we are talking about real large-scale um, uh, processes and large-scale plants and obviously large-scale financing and higher level technical expertise. Um, finally, I, I, want, I want to call on the, the last uh, presenter to um, try and tie together the first two presentations. So, um, Andrew um, Echono, his uh, presentation is going to be from the point of view of um, the finance, financer, the the project commissioner, the, the person who actually pays to get the project off the ground. And I think um, once you hear from him, I think you'll begin to see how the three presentations relate to each other, and then we can have uh, the Q&A and the audience participation. So Andrew, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Andre Chono. I'm the content program coordinator for US ADF in Nigeria. Um, I'm here to, like the uh, moderator said, tie the two presentations together. Um, I want to thank uh, Fatima and Toyin for making my presentation easy. So the US Africa Development Foundation is an independent agency of the US government, strictly focused on Africa development. And so um, th that's the only agency that works only in Africa. Some other agencies work across the world, but ADF works only with Africa and with Africa enterprises. We provide seed capital and you know, technical support to um, you know, enterprises in rural areas um, in, across Africa. And in Nigeria, we work in <coughs> the North Central and Niger Delta. Um, we currently have uh, projects cutting across three portfolios, agriculture, off-grid energy, and um, rich entrepreneurship. Agriculture being our biggest portfolio followed by off energy and then youth entrepreneurship. In agriculture, we have over 25 to 30 projects. Of the off energy, 12 projects in our portfolio, and then uh, much lesser for the youth enterprise portfolio. And so I'll focus on our off energy portfolio because that's what's most relevant to us here today. Now, ADF aims to you know, provide um, you know, solutions to the power problem in Africa um, by you know, focusing on by you know, supporting um, enterprises in Africa owned and controlled by Africans 
to provide innovation, innovative solutions to the power problems that we have. So we provide grants from between $100,000 to $150,000 to support Africa-owned enterprises, young entrepreneurs in Africa, to be able to provide solutions um, to power problems, especially from the you know, mini-grid and you know, micro-grid perspective. Um, the capital we provide is unable to provide you know, power at a very large scale, but you know, with the more fund we provide, we believe we are able to provide um, power of between um, 10 um, kilowatts and you know, 100 most of the time. And then we have only one project providing about 500 kilowatts somewhere in Ondo State. Uh, for our waste power project, uh, like I said in our portfolio, we have 12 projects in off grid energy. Nine of them are solar solutions project, and then three of them are waste to power project. One being um, the one um, um, implemented by Ajima Farms in Kuje. We have one other one uh, one other in Ondo State. That's the only biomass project, the gasifier project in Ondo State, and then we have another biodigester project in Cross River State. Um, now. Going straight to our, the risk that we face in, you know, in investing in biomass projects in Nigeria, uh, we want to um, look at the level of interest you know, in that sector. We know, you know the level of interest at, in that sector now is so low that you know, it's unable to you know, take it to a level that is going to be commercially viable. And so part of our strategy is to see how we can increase awareness um, for people to take interest in this project. But we are unaware, we, you know, we are aware of the fact that there is a limit to how much um, um, bio, um, biomass project can contribute to the, you know, to the power problem that we have in, in Nigeria. And so we still want to scale up interest, you know, so that we can meet that target. And then another problem we, we see working with some of our partners, is the, like I, um, Fatima mentioned, is the, the level of technical expertise we have in the con in country. It's so low that most of the, the you know, operations and management of some of these systems we get from out of the country. And so our fear is that if we are unable to build local expertise in this sector, it will get to a time where if our local entrepreneurs are unable to fund, you know, bring in foreign expertise, they may have to abandon the plant and it becomes redundant and then the investments are lost. And then um, one, of the, one of our goals is to link Apart from providing grants to uh, you know, uh, grantees in Nigeria, we also try to link them to follow-on financing, where we get private sector players to take interest in the project that they run, and also invest in them so that we, the projects can grow to a to a scale that is you know sustainable. But we we find that a lot of people, because of the interest, the the level of knowledge and awareness on these kinds of projects, you know, most of the time banks and other institutions are shying away from investing. For, because, because they do not have the technical expertise or know-how to be able to appraise this project. And so if we are able to you know, fund research that will develop educational materials for them to be able to use to appraise projects, then we know that um, that problem will be solved. And then um, finally, we see, even though um, the, the government regulation allows um, mini-grids or micro-grids from zero to 100, to operate without licensing, um, we still feel that you know certain prices, um, you know control prices, might, controlling you know prices might not be you know um, sustainable in the longer term. It may not be able to attract the level of interest uh, that you know a lot of people might want to bring into this uh, project. So we want to see a situation where the market will be deregulated so that a lot of people will come in. Yeah, and so for the policy area, we want to look at some of the government policies that um, that you know that will be beneficial to the project that we run. We are not policy makers here. We, we invest and then look for opportunities to scale up. And so we see a huge opportunity in the recent pronouncement of the government to ban the importation of rice. Um, as I, uh, Fatima mentioned, you know, there's a lot of biomass produced you know, in rice production. For every one ton of you know, rice meal, you get, you get about 1.5 tons of biomass. And so we are looking at a situation whereby this um, rice cost can be used to power, you know, bio, um, bio mass gasifier plant that can be used to generate electricity to process the same rice to a scale that is commercially viable. And we know that with the ban and importation of rice, this is one project that uh, we know is going to be successful. Because most of the rice that we consume 
in country are produced in the rural areas where there is little or no access to electricity. Most of the cottage industries are powered you know, by diesel generator, which is expensive and cuts into their profit, or at best, you know, the cost is pushed to us. And so if we, we see a huge opportunity in this sector um, to invest and scale up our investment and also attract foreign um, other investors, private sector players. Thank you. So thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for that um, uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard, um, as I said, three aspects of this uh, particular issue, you know, uh, power generation at that level, because that is a whole subject on its own, and I think the intention is to have a special, um, uh, a special seminar on municipal waste collection and municipal waste power. Um, but having said that, um, I think um, uh, we'll just go straight into um, a few questions that I will ask uh, the panelists to enable us to um, sharpen our discussion. The first one is uh, to do with uh, policy. Um, we've had uh, one or two suggestions in terms of, uh, in terms of what could be done um, uh, policy-wise. But I would like to ask, um, first of all, Toyin, from the Kenyan experience, what is present in Kenya which allowed such a project to be developed at such a quick pace that is absent in Nigeria, which uh, led to the success in Kenya and to the near absence of such a um, uh, level of interest by GE, well, level of uh, uh, success uh, so far by GE in Nigeria. So what do, uh, do the Kenyans have policy-wise? Okay. That's a, a great question. Uh, what we saw in Kenya clearly is that the tariffs Supported the tariffs that the um, government was willing to pay for the power um, supply to the grid clearly supported the economic viability of the project, right? Um, because I think clearly the um, the utility company owned by the government saw it as an opportunity to extend the access to power because the farm was located or the farm is located in the rural area where the access to power is quite low. Um, and so um, they were willing to sign up to um, a PPA that guarantees a cost-reflective tariff that sort of backs up then the investment in the project. And I think as Nigeria, we also need to get to that point. And I think that's probably the objective also of REA, the Rural Electrification Agency, um, clearly to look at rural areas that are not serviced today by the grid in smaller buckets and really see is it possible to have you know, a reverse power project that supports power to those areas. So I would say we are on, on the path, but we are not quite there. Uh, we are not quite there yet. In terms of being able to have the government support cost-reflective tariffs, and I think it's a bigger discussion even on the bigger power plants, the gas-fired power plants, but even now, going smaller and going um, rural electrification, we, the government needs to have a clear policy around enabling small-scale projects targeted at um, supplying power to rural areas. And it's interesting because anytime this comes up, the question then comes, are these guys able to pay for the power? But the truth is they're paying much more now with diesel. They're paying much more now with diesel. That's the clear policy. They are paying much more now with diesel. So I think if, if we can put a value proposition on the table that says, you know, um, if you pay so much, as long as, as long as it's less than diesel, if you can pay so much and we can guarantee you 247, you'll be amazed that these people will pay. Because what it would then do is there's a multiplier effect then on the economies, on the economic development, on the small scale businesses, the you know the traders, the people that sell frozen food you know, the um, uh, electrician, there's going to be a whole multiplier effect then on the economic development in rural areas. So I think that's a clear policy that the government needs to work on. Thank you very much, Zoe. I think uh, we've heard it there that um, the, 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 the clear suggestion is that there should be a, um, a government policy to support um, a price to producers of power who are using waste as their, uh, as their feedstock to enable them to be able to um, compete and to um, also take into account the wider societal benefits 
of actually using waste as their feedstock. We've already discussed the fact that by going into waste to power, you're providing, for example, the reduction in methane, which is a, a major um, a greenhouse gas. You're also trying to improve the environment. You're producing raw materials for construction. You're producing fly ash. You're producing uh, non-ferrous metals. You're taking away things that could shoot, go into uh, things that would have gone into landfill. And as we know, landfill opportunities are getting tighter and tighter. And it's not a, a particularly pleasant thing for us to continue to just send our waste uh, to landfill. The next question is to um, uh, uh, Fatima. Fatima, I would like to um, really take you um, back into project development because I think a lot of people here are interested in how do you actually get such a project off the ground. So in terms of guaranteeing the quantity, the quality, and the consistency of waste, what are the low-hanging fruits you see around the country? Where would you like investors to look at in terms of identifying such reliable sources of consistently high quality waste in terms of the, um, being able to develop such projects as you've successfully developed? Okay, so um, low-hanging fruits are in the agricultural industry, um, not to me about it. When you look at the waste we produce generally as a country, about 60 to 80 percent of the waste are biodegradable waste. And then when you Take it down a bit further to agricultural waste, as I've mentioned. When we take rice, for example, look at the states producing rice. The resource, which is the rice hogs and rice straws, are just lying there and not doing anything. When you take it to the animal sector, you look at um, those doing intensive poultry and some intensive farm for cattle and other forms of animal. They're also producing waste but not using it for anything. So you could have, as a project developer, rather than trying to going to the municipal solid waste, which is a whole lot of issue on its own, as he mentioned, which we need a separate day to discuss that. You can look at the agro sector and say, I'm going to Taraba, I'm going to Eboi, and I'm going to the communities where this rice hogs is, and I'm putting a project in there. Or you can look into the poultry to say, on oh, Kujay Axis, we have two million poultry. What are they doing with the waste? Nothing. So that is a resource. So looking at the agro sector, or you could even pick the salt, the um, dust, salt dust um, sector. You have milling plants in the south, cutting down trees, using it for other products. And the salt dust can also be gasified and used for um, electrification. So these are the low-hanging fruits that, instead of trying to push for some policies to make municipal um, solid waste more viable, which will take time, you look at those agro waste and yeah, you can start from there. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question really um, will touch a bit on technology. I think we shouldn't be afraid of technology. Um, waste to power really um, uh, can be divided essentially into three major technology paths. Um, the first one is combustion, which is pure incineration of the waste. Next one is gasification, where you, um, in the presence of limited oxygen, produce uh, syngas, which you burn to produce energy. And of course, the last one is pyrolysis, where you have, for example, the Kenyan experience, where you have decomposition of uh, organic matter to produce methane, which again you burn to produce power. Um, Andrew, you have financed two different technologies um, in this sector. You financed um, uh, the um, uh, biogas uh, production uh, facility, and you've also financed the, um, the biomass uh, uh, generators. Can you please explain to this audience the difference between a biogas-based solution and a biomass-based solution? Okay, um, as I said in my presentation, we have three uh, projects in Nigeria, um, both hot and cold technology. Uh, for the hot technology, that is the, bio, um, the biomass, the gasification project. Uh, essentially, what um, uh, Grantee is doing in you know, the community in you know, those states where we have huge um, agricultural waste and you know um, sawdust waste. What he's doing is he has built a plant that uses um, the the agricultural waste and other wood you know fuel to power a gasifier that has an inbuilt combustor, and um, the the combustor is you know used to you know to burn super hot steam that, that is connected to a turbine. And that is connected to a, a generator, an inductive generator that is used to generate electricity. So that is the first technology, the hot technology. And so some of the residue from the from the gasified waste is used to 
um, some of the gasified waste is used as um, fertilizer to you know for for the farm. And then the other technology, the cool technology is the one the um, anaerobic um, one that uh, Ajima just mentioned. Uh, sorry, I call Ajima. I know more about uh, Ajima than Fatima. Uh, Fatima. Um, it's, essentially, it's essentially about you know using um, waste from animal, um, waste from animal and other food um, residue, you know, it, um, putting them into a dome and then without oxygen and using microorganisms to you know break them down into methane gas and that gas is used to generate electricity. So that's the other technology, the cool technology. Just a quick follow on from that, I would like um, to ask Andrew if you will be interested in supporting the development of pilot projects at a really micro level, at a five animal uh, per household level, the type of simple um, uh, uh, gas generators that a family with five cows and with a woman cooking food for, for example, for school can, um, uh, can use. Can you, um, would you be interested in developing projects at that level? Because for us, I think the idea of having you know one million chicken before you take off a project, before you have a project, is a little bit too far-fetched. And in some other countries, I know in Serbia, in Georgia, in, in some of in some of these countries, they have a lot of development of family-scale um, anaerobic generators that can be um, can be put into place. Would you be interested in pushing that? And for example, would you be um, in a position, to, for example, to have 15 or so projects within the next one year? Uh, as Andrew, I'll be willing to form. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, the ADF, um, as an entity, um, uh, like I said in my introduction, is focused on businesses. So our uh, own strategy is to fund Africa owned and Africa led businesses. So it's all about the economy. It has to bring back something. Um, our grant isn't about making people feel good. It's about generating, you know. Um, economic value for you know the entire society to grow so we, we look at the bottom line for us is to ensure that everybody's pocket grows you know bigger than it is currently thank you very much Andrew. i think um, as i said uh, this is a, um, this is a topic that if we had the opportunity we would have had 12 panelists because it's a very wide topic there is um, there is a big opportunity at the level below the agro businesses so and andrew's organization is focused at supporting investors and developers like many people in this room who go to a farm and they provide an energy solution to that farm. So Andrew's organization funds such developers to provide solutions to farms. But there is of course anaerobic generators and those uh, tend to cost about um, between 50 to 70,000 naira per family. So that is um, a topic for another day. But um, the next quick question before I throw the questions open to, uh, to the audience is um, to Toyin. Toyin actually hit the nail squarely on the head. It said, she said that the biggest impediment to the development of waste to energy in Nigeria is the lack of clear waste management policies. Policies that enable the collection, the management, and the recycling of waste. But in order to get to those policies, um, the country as a whole needs to imbibe the, um, the whole idea that um, you know, life works in cycles, and if you try and not align yourself to those life cycles, there is always a cost. A cost to you, a cost to your family, a cost to the nation, a cost to the environment, and a cost to obviously to your future. In uh, waste management and waste handling, there is a hierarchy of um, what's the best way to handle waste. So you, uh, obviously, landfill is probably the worst thing you can do in terms of waste, and then obviously the, the next from that is um, uh, trying to just incinerate the waste, burn the waste to get rid of it, and then the next one is trying to get energy from the waste. But even more important than that, there, is the, there are the three hours of waste management. So you want to recycle, you want to reuse, and most importantly, you want to reduce waste. So I want to ask Toyin to um, perhaps give us an indication of um, any experience that GE has where there can be an integrated policy that supports a complete waste management solution that can be bankable. Is it actually possible? 
to for a company to be dedicated to reducing, to reusing, and to um, uh, recycling waste, as well as generating power profitably? Has it been done in terms of um, uh, the experience that GE has anywhere in the world? Okay, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. So, in terms of the policy, I think it's going to be it has to be government driven, right? So, private sector can sort of get the word out, educate ourselves, get government in such a forum, and get them also to see the huge potential. Beyond just talking about it, get them to see that there's action that needs to be taken for them to develop such a policy. But I'm going to also give, then the second part I'm going to answer, um, the way I'm going to answer the question is, I'm going to give an example of a landfill site in Dubai, where we also have our engines and stuff. So it's a landfill. I know you said the landfill is the worst, um, or you said it's at the, the lowest level. <laughs> I, 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 I want to clarify what I mean. What I mean is the old school old landfill, school. where you just dump the waste. Obviously, there are new landfills where you first of all make the landfill absolutely impervious, yeah. so you don't have groundwater contamination. Yeah. Then you put in pipes to harness the gas, and then you finish the landfill by covering the landfill and harvesting the gas. So in Australia, for example, there is a stadium which has been built on top of the landfill. Right. And the stadium is fully powered by the gas coming out of the landfill. So, but that's not the kind of landfill I mean. The kind of landfill I mean okay. is the kind of landfill that's outside of Moa here. <laughs> <laughs> Where the tipper just goes into the bush and dumps. the lake of yeah. the <laughs> Thank you for helping yeah. me. Make so, it thanks for that clarification because the example I'm going to give is exactly what you just described. It's a landfill, it's open, but you won't smell it then. Right? And it's because it's properly engineered. So, you know, there are pipes beneath the landfill that enables the collection of the methane gas that is generated on the landfill. You know, if, if for the landfill that you mentioned in Umiaya and, and the one in, in Ojota, I mean, it's open to flares because the methane is not being properly collected. And if there's any spark, you find a fire burning. And it has huge environmental impact. But I'm talking now about a landfill that is properly engineered, exactly what they described in Australia. We have a project in Dubai that is generating about three megawatts. It's a landfill and you drive past and you will not even know that there is a landfill there. And the way they've integrated the waste collection is what I want to describe, just to, to, to emphasize uh, and to answer your question. So they collect the waste, and in collecting the waste, they actually pay, they actually pay the, the, the people generating the waste to collect the waste. And I think that's one of the things that Lagos State is trying to do, buy back of waste basically to encourage people to be able to give up their waste and annex it in a proper way. So that's the first thing that is done for that land, land, uh, landfill site. They actually pay people to collect their waste, that's number one. And then the second step is a proper sorting. There's a proper sorting of the waste. So they separate the plastics from the organic waste. Uh, and then clearly the plastics are recycled. The plastics are recycled. And then the organic waste is then taken then to the landfill and dumped on the landfill. And the power generated from the landfill powers a district in Dubai. And they also get they supply the grid and they get paid for the power. And clearly that's, I mean, that's a, a case in point in terms of an integrated waste management policy. Of course, Dubai is such a city where, you know, they're very particular about how waste is managed. They're very particular about environmental protection. And that creates a big opportunity for a private developer to collect the waste, recycle part of the waste, and generate also power from, part of, from the remaining part of the waste, and then also earn revenue from the waste. So the underlying factor is the government policy, and then the private sector can then latch on that and develop a, an integrated economic viable project um, to run um, on that. Thank you very, very much for that, um, I think, uh, extremely, um, I think, um, uh, explanatory and the, um, informative um, answer, uh, Toyin. I think what Toyin has, um, uh, you know, what, what, what I've tried to do is to draw her out into emphasizing that um, government has to support some of those two things she mentioned in her presentation, which is there has to be a price when you dispose of your rubbish, and that price has to give you an incentive to reduce the amount of rubbish you generate. There has to be a price when the company that collects the money from you and the rubbish from you goes to tip the, the rubbish. 
if that rubbish is sorted, the price for disposing of the rubbish will be lower. And the company that takes over that rubbish has to then um, recycle some of that rubbish, for example, plastics, and then use some of that rubbish to uh, generate power, which is then fed back into the municipality. So as you can see, there are many opportunities here for um, with, uh, wealth creation, for um, taking care of the environment, for making sure that there is power, and of course for creating a lot of uh, employment. So thank you very, very much, and I think um, um, uh, the, the, the panelists have been able to, I think, I think state the case that waste power is something that has unduly been neglected for too long, and it's an area which should attract a lot of both government, um, industry, and um, non-governmental um, organizations. Morris Smith. Um, many of you know me. I'm a power. And I was very worried when KK informed me to come along and this. Because I thought this would all be about power. And being about power is incorrect. Power is the tail of the dog in waste management. Your people presenting are telling the truth. It's managing the waste, it's getting the government or local government at any level involved that this is absolutely necessary. The power at the back end of it is the icing on the cake. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first is this evening. Um, there was some, Andrew rather, there's been some talk over the years about, about carbon credits and, and the use of carbon credits. And I, I don't think it was mentioned in your presentation. Do they still apply? The second question is to Tony. Uh, you mentioned that one of the main reasons that we really takes off the price of 50 to 50 naira is the fact that they have to go out and collect the waste. And I was wondering that if state government, in regards to municipal solid waste, provides support by actually dumping the waste at, at these particular sites, will that bring the price down? And that finally impacts on Fatima's question, is that once you go to the agriculture sector, since they don't have to go out to collect the waste, are we actually talking about the same pricing structure as this slightly cheaper? Thanks, Greg. Thank you very, very much. Distinguished gentlemen, uh, speakers, good evening. My name is Damien Wilhelman, I work with Eugenesis Energy, a company which is developing feasibility studies uh, to harness alter alternative energy technologies and particularly waste of power technologies. Uh, this is a demo mentioned uh, various waste of power configurations that are available, as we're all very uh, aware of biomass systems, biogas systems, etc. Now, my question is given the social and economic challenges associated with each of these configurations, which one is the most viable and profitable in the Nigerian setting? And I would like you to be very specific in terms of the uh, tariff which is associated with this generation, uh, the Naira, the Naira per kilowatt hour. Thank you. Power uh, from waste by um, uh, using policy to uh, mandate that the waste management companies bring the waste to the incinerator or to the waste, sorry, to the waste processing facility. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think theoretically, if the government is responsible for collecting the waste and bringing it to your site, yes, of course, it will reduce your price. But you know very well that you can't leave that in the hands of government. I mean, government can, can, can have, they can set up the policy, but in terms of waiting on government to collect and bring it to your site as a project developer, I think that would be set up for failure. Right, so theoretically, yes, it can reduce your price, but it will not be the best way um, to set up your project because it could either make or break your project. You want to vertically integrate and ensure that you have control over, you know, the waste getting to your site at the right time and at the right consistency. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question I would like to uh, address to uh, Fatima, um, and I do apologize completely. I did not mention anything about it, and, but I will leave it to the expert to. To, um, to handle it. Um, carbon credits, are carbon credits still applicable and how are they applicable in, in the area of um, waste to power? Oh, sorry, Andrew. Uh, and then at the same time, we take the second question. On the issue of carbon credit, um, within the project that we, we run, there are no issues of, about carbon credit. I know carbon credit works very well outside Nigeria, but I'm not aware of any such policy in the country. 
Okay, then there was a question about um, uh, what is the most uh, viable um, in terms of uh, the technologies, biomass or biogas, and do you have any figures in terms of uh, uh, Naira per kilowatt hour in terms of cost of production based on the numbers you've run? Um, maybe you can consult with Fatima if you would. You... Uh, I'll allow Fatima to see the technical person in the field to answer that question. Okay, so in terms of the viability of the technology, it really depends on where you are going to. So if you are going to Taraba, for example, where it's mainly rice box, then obviously it's a classification technology. So I can't give a blanket answer to say it's always going to be anaerobic digestion. It's basically based on what waste resources of you have there. And in terms of the cost, so for me I'm focusing on off-grid projects. Um, and as you know, the legend, we don't have to get a license and you basically negotiate with the community to reach a tariff for the businesses you are supplying to. So then that tariff only applies when you start with on grid project and for that you consult with NEC on the MITO tariff. Okay, thank you very, very much. So we're going to take uh, three more questions. There's one hand at the back there. Sorry. My name is Imran Chuku. The Federal Minister of Power. I'm a power investor in the investment and sector uh, development uh, department of the ministry. However, I know something about the business management of this out uh, because uh, when you invest in waste power and you are using an incinerator, well, part of the best is you could also uh, get bottled water from the coolant because one uh, is advised that when you are citing a waste of power, um, you know, plant should be near a river because uh, of the incinerator, you need something that will cool it. And when it's being cooled, the water can be collected and used as bottled water. It will help the investor. Thank you. My name is David Arinze, I'm a field and special economics and I'm My question is now. There are a number of communities, even in Abuja today, that don't have access to the grid. What are the requirements that these communities need to meet in order to access some, some, of, some sort of funding to electrify their various communities? i give you examples like um, Guasaki. Uh, well, I don't know if you've heard about Guasaki, yes, but when I was um, trying to get my findings about this community that's um, around the Koje, Koje era council, and I discovered that they have to travel every day about 30 minutes to 45 minutes on um, bikes, motorcycles, to the market before they can charge their phones. In the community, they have over 500 people, and they don't have access to power. Even their village chief does not have a generator. How can we ensure that these persons have access to, I believe, it's a big rural education project. And from what I discovered, after putting more this together, I discovered that it would not be more than 250 kilowatts of power to light up that whole place. So how can these kind of communities have access to clean energy? And the majority of them are farmers, so we can also integrate some other form of systems that can aid revenue generation from this community. Thank you. I'm an industrial engineer. I work with uh, Sterling Asset Management Limited. Uh, for me, uh, my opinion might be uh, might not be very popular uh, with respect to what I've had this time. Uh, just like we talked about uh, uh, emission uh, emission credit and all that, it doesn't work in Nigeria. I think the same way the TV system, I don't think it can work in Nigeria. I think it should be the other way For example. Let us look at uh, uh, materials that are in the front line of. Uh, Please, can you just ask a question? Yes, materials in, in the front line of in the front line of, uh, of recycling, like cartons, like uh, bottles, plastic, you know, pet bottles, and all that. Before now, before uh, people got to know that those things were valuable, we would see them around. But now, we don't see pet bottles around anymore. We don't see cartons around anymore. Why? Because they have become valuable. I want the paper to be cartons along the road. And they sell, they sell a kg of cartons for less than 20 naira. 
They sell a kg of red water for that Please, can you ask a question so that we can address? Now, what I'm saying is, I'm ask asking. a question. Ask one question. Okay. I'm saying that. Is it possible? Is it possible for us to develop a system whereby waste management, rather than people pay for their waste to be managed, for their waste to be collected, people are being paid to deliver the waste for the for the use for for um, waste to power for waste to power generation. Thank you. Fatima and Tony mentioned a couple of things about the REA and the Rural Education Fund and how you can support this sort of you know project. I just wanted to mention that we have the mandate to promote rural education in Nigeria, and uh, we have the Rural Education Fund, which has been there since 2006 and has not been operationalized. So we have, you know, right now, put all the modalities in place to have it operationalized before the end of the year. We've gotten approval from our board just recently, and we're just waiting for the final approval from the minister. And these sort of projects can benefit from, you know, with technology neutral. We're looking at renewables, all sorts of renewables. We also encourage uh, gas to, you know, gas to uh, power sort of plants. And she also mentioned about policy, not having government policy, you know, to encourage the, that prize for rural electrification being launched. As a matter of fact, we had um, NERC organized a workshop of stakeholders just to inform them and, you know, sort of enlighten them about, you know, the minimum regulations. It allows for a different set of prize, you know, different from what we have on grid. So it could be higher, it's mostly higher than what we're having with for these rural communities. So we can take advantage of it if you want, you can download you know, the new regulations from their website. You'll find all the information that you need there. And for REF, like I mentioned, before the end of the year, hopefully we'll be doing a call for proposal. So people that are interested and you know have this sort of projects, they can start working towards a proposal, you can bring it and then because we're trying to partner with the private sector. We'll see how we can support you with some grants and then you bring some people to how we, we, we put some projects on, on the ground. Thank you. Please, then, before you sit down and before we give you the round of applause which you deserve, <laughs> uh, I want to pose the question number two to you, which is there is a particular community which is absolutely remote, they are suffering critical energy, uh, lack of access. What kind of conditions? Will be required for such communities to meet what you envisage in your program, which you are about to launch. Um, okay, not just one community. We have about 7,882 communities in Nigeria, based on what we have our data. You know, of potentially viable mini grid clusters. So what, we don't have the funds to do all of this. So it's going to be very competitive. Um, what we intend to do initially, we wanted to allow developers to come come up with some proposals for all of these communities. And we, we also want to reduce the burden on them by doing some of these ourselves. So we're going to be doing the two. If we have these sort of communities and we have interested developers that have gone down there to do some sort of demand assessments and survey and audits, they can come up with it when we do our call for proposal. It's going to be based you know, on the whole country. It's going to be geopolitical uh, zone based. So they can either bring us or we also guide them with what we have and say we also have some of these communities around if you want to go down and do you know your demand or assessment and come up with proposal, it's fine. If you also have proposals for specific uh, communities like he has mentioned, you can also come up with it. So once we do the call for proposal, it's open to everyone to come really. All you need is just you know do like I said the feasibility or reliability analysis, be sure of the technology that you want to use. And then have like a price that is reasonable. It's going to be an open book thing. So you don't just come and give us the price and take. We have the experts in house that will sit down with we you, look at a financial model, make sure it's you know the price is also fair. We want you to make um, some profits, obviously, but we don't want you to also exploit, you know, yeah, those in the rural areas. So it's going to be an open book thing, we look at it and then we you know discuss and see how we can arrive at something that is fair and uh, cost reflective. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I would like to call on Fatima to just uh, add something to you. So I would like to add two things to what um, he just mentioned. Free. It's not for free and they can pay for it. So if you have any doubts that these communities can pay for their electricity, just know they can pay for it. So when we, before we started, we did a visibility study where we went to almost every household to understand their energy demand. 
And you'd be surprised to see that some communities already spend up to 1,500 Naira a week to buy a battery for Torchlight. That is a huge expense just for a minute lighting solution. So you can imagine, they, have, they do have the money and they are already spending on alternate forms of electrification. But if you are able to do a centralized system and supply them with a mini grid system, it actually reduces the cost per community. And if you are a project developer looking to go into any community, the first thing you need to know that community engagement is critical. Please do not go into a community and just start putting up systems without speaking with the community. We need to ensure, because we've seen such, we've seen such projects, and that's why the community vandalized such projects. From the first day you're going into that community, your first task should be to get the community to understand what you're trying to do. When you understand, because they know the benefits and they'll buy in, but if, you don't if they don't understand that they see you as just a superior person coming to change you know, the dynamics of the community, that is when you face pushback. So please ensure that you involve the community from, the, from day one. Don't start and try to involve them later. Involve them from the beginning and you will see that you have the best partners in terms of the people within the communities. Uh, thank you very much, Fatima. So, Why don't you just tell the big Six or seven hundred thousand tons of virtual waste, put in an incinerator, generate six, eighty, ninety megawatts of power, put directly into the Abuja grid supply. You don't need government intervention, it should all be local. Put it out of the sewage plant and use the gas generator the sewage plant to give you digestive feed. Straightforward, simple, six or seven hundred billion dollars would see it all done. In about four years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. The virtually all the presenters talked about policy and I'm worried about it. Tony responded to the question which was asked the, the problems with policy and she said it is government due. I want to add, you I agree with it with her. But uh, if there are other private people to bring important bills to be sponsored by members, one of the bills signed into law by the president just recently was initiated outside and was signed into law for the benefit of all. So please, if you have good ideas and legislation that will help this cause, please do bring to the National Assembly it will be sponsored. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is John from Radius Industries. Um, I just want to ask, this is um, to all the private sector uh, people here. I wanted to ask what the private sector is doing to um, in, um, create sustainability for this sort of idea because we know Nigeria is one of those people that we come up with very great ideas but sustaining is actually not a problem. And by that, I mean, is there any room to kind of bring in the academia to actually um, create awareness for waste of power or in other ways, something related to this? Um, so, if there is no room to talk about it. The first question in terms of uh, Abuja Municipal um, Power Opportunity. Um, Tony, what do you think, uh, what would it take? to um, develop a project of that scale in Abuja, because I think um, uh, that's off your street. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds very interesting. You know, you said 90 megawatts or 60 megawatts? Uh, just know what it's not going to be. We do it on the yesterday. 600 million euros, uh -huh. 600,000 tons of rubbish, uh -huh. and 80 million, sorry, 80 megawatts of power, electricity, and 50 megawatts of uh, power. Yeah, so 80 megawatts. And the first question that came to my head is, you know, is the waste in Abuja collector central today? And I think it's, you know, it's, it's great to have such a big idea, but then if you have the waste to kick it off, do you have the waste coming in a sustainable manner to, to keep the project running over its lifetime? It's not possible, it's possible, but we need to really think down the value chain to say where is the waste coming from? How is it going to be collected and how is it going to be sustainable? But clearly, I mean, it's something that we need to explore further to see. It's working in other places. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work here. 
you know, with the right policies. Let me add to that. So, in the case of Dublin UK, they have a clear waste management system where every household puts up your trash, a truck comes to pick it up, take it to the incinerator. But that is not the reality here in Abuja. Where I live, you can walk five minutes away and put your trash out. No one is going to pick it up, it's still going to be there. So, we don't have that logistic you know, value chain to figure out. So, if you have to build such an incinerator, what would happen is, assuming you find the funding somewhere to build it, you will find waste to power it because the waste is scattered across the country or across the state as you may say. And the logistics, if you were to go pick it up yourself, the logistics would be too expensive because you get you don't get that in Nigeria. Imagine trucks scattered around trying to pick up waste all the way from Pali to Buari. You are going to waste all your money on buying diesel for those trucks as opposed to actually solving any waste issues. Okay, clearly, um, the, the question and answer that we've had on this topic has exposed, uh, for example, a weakness in the legislation. Uh, the Abuja Environmental Protection Agency uh, Enabling Act is there, but the problem is that, as we can see, there appears to be no way of mandating them to um, actually be consistent and to be um, absolutely to, uh, to, to follow some kind of law. The law appears to uh, be more um, focused on people not avoiding uh, the payment of money to Abuja Environmental Protection Agency. I, I, I know this because um, they, they, if you refuse to pay them, they can actually force you to pay them. But the law obviously has a loophole, doesn't actually mandate them to do what is necessary without waste once they've picked it up. Um, I can give you an example of uh, what's going on in the army barracks at the back of uh, Abuja. The waste condition there is absolutely deplorable. We actually have rivers of sewage flowing through army barracks at the back of Abuja. And the Abuja Environmental Protection Agency has not responded to any invitation to deal with their problem. So the law is lax there. I remember, um, uh, you know, I have to say this because I think it's part of this policy discourse. The laws have to be better. In the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the laws were tightened, for example, in the UK with regards to water. So companies like Thames Water suddenly saw themselves paying hundreds of millions of pounds in fines because they were putting effluent into the River Thames. And it was cheaper for them to invest billions to stop polluting the Thames than to carry on paying the fines because the laws were very, very tight and they were enforced. So there's an opportunity here to force municipal waste management companies to actually handle the waste properly. There has to be an offense, both in terms of a corporate offense and an individual offense for mishandling waste. And once you get to that level, then it becomes easier for companies that are developing projects to be able to look into the future and say, this company will deliver this waste because the waste is produced. It will be illegal for them not to deliver the waste to this particular company, and then such projects can become viable. So I think that I would, uh, I would like to uh, perhaps invite uh, Fatima to um, answer the question of when such a project has taken off, what are the basic ground rules to ensure that the project has long-term uh, sustainability? So what are those things that must be in place before the project takes off that ensure that the projects are viable long-term? Especially with regards to involving academia. Okay, and especially yes, with regards to involving uh, some kind of development of new applications and new ways. Okay, so basically, um, there are two ways about it. First is awareness, because as I said earlier, a lot of people are not even aware of ways to power technologies, and that's why I'm so thankful to next year for organizing this, because with this, we have at least less 100 people who didn't know about ways to power than now know about ways to power. On our own project, in terms of sustaining it, we are in a community that needs electricity, that have waste, poultry farms that have waste and need electricity, so that is sorted out. The systems are good for 25 years, so you know at least for the next 25 years you have waste and you have people to actually sell the electricity, the end product to. And we're also doing research with university, but not really on the digestion, but on, on the byproduct. So the byproduct is biofertilizer, which is good to use as fertilizer for planting. We're actually doing research now where we're trying to see what are the difference if we're to test run using the byproduct from that to plant as opposed to using organic fertilizer, and that is the work we are doing with um, the university in my own project. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for having waited uh, till now. Um, uh, some, some very, very important uh, things are yet to happen. There will be a summation of our discussion this evening by next year, so they will sort of recap what we've discussed. 
Um, I will also give a preamble to that summation. But before we get there, there are three questions that I've, uh, I've promised to take. Once we take them, I'll make some uh, closing comments, and then next year will give us um, a summation of uh, what we've discussed, um, what we've achieved, and some pointers uh, for the way forward. So, uh, two questions. My name is Ruben Bamedele. I work for the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Uh, if you permit me, it's an information that we provide technical assistance on this type of project. We've implemented a 32 kilowatt gas station plant in Eboi using wood chips. We are implementing a 5 megawatt power plant using rice husk in Eboi State. And currently, we've done technical and feasibility studies in urban those states uh, on the usage of um, sawdust. At the moment, we are compiling the research plans, and the information is for those who would like to invest, developers, that at the end of September, the business plans for about nine sites in Rondo State and Ogun will be available for those who are interested. For instance, in Abel Kutak North local government, we've estimated one megawatt capacity in that place. Abel Kutak South, one megawatt. In the abode, if four megawatt. In the abode, North, four megawatt. Abre South, 10 megawatt. Abre North, four megawatt. In the only one megawatt. Or three megawatt. And Odebo, four megawatt. So if those are interested, can contact us at Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Abdel Babakano. I am an NYC corporate with PFM. So, mine is not a question, mine is an idea that I want to share, which was quickly, uh, directly, in 30 seconds. Mrs. Toy, you said that like for one megawatt of electricity to be produced, they need a dumps from 7,000 cows. So, like, I've got an idea. Uh, an idea where a kind of a career will be will be made, which has a vacuum, and those kind of careers will be, will be given to herdsmen. And when it's given to the herdsmen, as the cows defecate, <laughs> they will just use the vacuum. <laughs> thank you very much for your thank you very much for your interest. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, my name is Anieti Ukuba. I'm the CEO of the uh, Anadin Limited. First of all, I want to answer the gentleman's question. I'm currently developing two by 15 megawatts uh, agricultural waste biomass, uh, sorry, agricultural waste energy plants in Mali, not in Nigeria. And what you are suggesting is what I'm actually doing, so it's feasible. That's it. Secondly, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Andrew, uh, being that uh, I'm not in the part of the off grid. Is it possible to get uh, seed financing for uh, projects, even if it's not in Nigeria, whether Nigeria or outside, as far as in Africa? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I request that has to do with uh, the wider ECOWAS uh, region. Uh, uh, okay, um, as I said in my introductory um, remark, we operate in 20 countries in Africa. And for projects, in Nigeria, where I am in charge of, we only fund companies that are registered in Nigeria. Now, for the for probably you are operating in Mali, we have a, okay. Let's say any country within West Africa that we are presently working, you can access grants in that country if you are registered in that country. But the only challenge will be that that company should be owned and run by the people in that country. Yeah, so if you want a grant, you are in Nigeria, you can apply here in Nigeria, and then you get. And, but that's not really the possibility of you getting grants in another country where we are working. You can still get a grant once the company is registered there and is run by the citizens of that country. Yeah. So you cannot get a grant in Mali if you are if from me in Nigeria, because there's somebody that will be in that country that will be in charge. So we have country program coordinators in every country that we work. Yeah. So thank you very, very much, Andrew, for that answer. And, uh, thank you 
very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's been a very, I think, informative session. Um, I just want to uh, quickly run through the pros and, believe it or not, there are some cons, there are some uh, negative aspects with regards to waste to energy. I'm going to make comments about uh, possibilities for government policy enhancement, possibilities for government policy enhancement, and once I finish, as I promised you, there will be a summing up uh, by next year about what we've done this evening. So we've uh, all heard about um, you know, the opportunities, for example, to improve the environment, to improve sanitation, to reduce waste, to help us to live healthier lifestyles, to create employment, to create, jo uh, to create um, economic opportunities for, for companies, for individuals, for organizations, and also for the government units. For example, states can make a lot of money just by being part of this waste management uh, ecosystem. We are obviously not impervious, and I think we should begin to pay more attention to reduction in the, um, in the um, greenhouse gases, especially in terms of capturing opportunities for uh, capturing methane and using methane to generate power instead of allowing that to escape into, um, into the environment. There are many, uh, the technology is uh, tested, the technology is mature, the technology is available, and the technology is affordable. Um, we have spoken in terms of um, the various skills that you can work in. There are very, very small scale possibilities to work in this sector. There are medium scale uh, possibilities, and there are obviously large scale opportunities to work in the waste to energy opportunity. There are uh, government programs that are available for you to key into. There are international agencies that are also working in the sector that are looking for partnerships. There is a, uh, there is, um, a lot of opportunity to grow your business because um, we can say, for, say one thing for sure, that waste management and environmental, um, environmentally sensitive uh, businesses will grow in the future. That we are sure about. Everybody can be certain about that. And in terms of uh, the, the, the downside, the downside that we have is, uh, 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 of obviously, we've mentioned some of them. Downsides are an uncertain um, policy environment. Downsides are, for example, the fact that we are not used to uh, handling our waste with care, so we don't sort the waste at source. We do not um, have processes that insist that households should handle their waste in a way that makes uh, waste collection easy. Uh, we also don't even have uh, policies to make sure, for example, that light facilities like, like hospitals and like markets are mandated to handle waste in a certain way. We have, um, people are not certain, there is a, lot, a very, very low level of awareness about the technologies, so people like banks are still unsure. Many banks have no capacity to assess uh, this type of project as it stands, and there are opportunities here to increase awareness. Then um, communities also need to be educated. As Fatima has said, um, you know, sometimes uh, people think they can come and impose such solutions on communities. It's best to try and educate them because when you start to educate the community, believe it or not, no matter how many degrees you have, the community will also educate you. And that mutual education will lead to a more successful project. Uh, finally, um, the cons we have, um, we have a system in place where if you get to a certain scale, especially once you go over the megawatt uh, scale, you start to fall into the uh, NERC environment where the tariffs are begin, uh, you know, will be uh, regulated and then that there are opportunities there for government to take a second look to look at specific cost-reflective uh, um, uh, uh, tariffs for this sector to encourage the sector so that they don't treat this sector as just any other sector. So um, that's, um, in short, uh, what, we've, um, what we've looked at. And um, at this point in time, I would like to um, hand over to um, uh, Emeka to um, uh, handle the rest of uh, the program. But thank you very, very much for being patient. Thank you for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm Mr. Sue Gobamian, an analyst at Next Year Power. I want to say thank you to all of you for spending your valuable time with us. We have been doing other things when you came here. I want to say thank you for that, for your valuable participation, for your intelligent questions. I also want to say that we have spoken about the challenges, the potential, the waste to power. What we must do from here on is take it to the field, take it to the investment sectors, take it to what we need to do further. We should not just leave it here in the room and forget about it. 
I also want to thank our panelists, most especially. I want to thank you, Toyin. I want to thank you, Fatima. I want to thank you, Andrew. You have made this event what it is today. Without you, we would not have been as knowledgeable in waste power as we are now. I want to thank you, Jerome. You have been an excellent moderator. Thank you so much. I want to thank the media representatives in the room right now. Thank you for representing Next Year Power and this Power Dialogue in a very good light. I also want to thank the owners of this um, building, that's the Third Pyramid Building, for your continuous support. Next on the line is just reminding you about the Nigerian Electricity Hall. We give updates about the power sector every day. So please continue to look out for it through your mails. If you have not been getting these mails, you can leave your email address with us if you have not already and you begin to get it from tomorrow. Thank you also. And then the next power dialogue is going to be on the 20th of September and we are going to be discussing on how we can actually get power to the 100 million Nigerians who are currently unconnected to the grid. So please mark your calendars right now, look out for that, and we would love to have you there. Thank you so much, and good night.